Hello everyone, it's time for another episode of Spicy Tofu, the show where we talk about some juicy hot takes in the world of Commander. Today's episode is about a pretty advanced tactic that most Commander players don't learn until they've become seasoned veterans of the game. But this high level strategy, when used correctly, can oftentimes let you snatch a victory from the jaws of defeat. In fact, some players think that it might be a little overpowered and should maybe even be banned. What is this forbidden technique that I'm talking about, you ask? It's called reading the card. Progress report. It's an older code, Skipper. I can't make it out. You hire mammal. Hmm? Can you read? No, Phil can read though. Phil? Reading the card explains the card. Anyone who's been playing Magic for long enough has definitely heard this phrase before. And yes, reading cards can legitimately greatly improve your gameplay. How else are you supposed to know that Mana Echoes triggers off of your opponent's creatures, or that tapping a City of Brass with a Chromatic Lantern still makes you take damage, or that Sovereigns of Alara doesn't fly? Okay, but like seriously though, why the heck does this thing not fly? It's a literal cloud. Anyways, it's true that reading cards will make you a much better Magic player. But it turns out that it's not a foolproof system. There are some cards out there that actually don't do what the words on them tell you to do. And I'm not talking about really old cards that just have weird text, or cards that work differently because of rules changes like companions. Today I'm going over three cards that just don't function the way they say that they should, and whether or not I think the rules should be changed to make them actually do what they say they do. First up, we have the Ozolith. This card doesn't seem that complicated at first. When your creatures die, you put the counters they had onto the Ozolith, and then you can move them around to your other dudes. But let's take a closer look at that first ability. It says whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put those counters on the Ozolith. Believe it or not, that sentence is not how the Ozolith works. What it should say is whenever a creature you control leaves the battlefield, if it had counters on it, put the same number of each kind of counter that creature had onto the Ozolith. You're probably wondering why this makes any difference. I mean, if my creature had 3 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, and then it dies, then what's the difference between moving those counters onto the Ozolith, or taking the counters off of the creature, and then putting 3 new counters on the Ozolith? Well, it's true that this actually doesn't make a difference 99% of the time. But there is one commander in specific that really cares about this detail, Skullbriar the Walking Grave. Skullbriar is the only creature in Magic that actually keeps its counters when it dies. So if you have a Skullbriar with three counters on it and an Ozolith, then when your Skullbriar dies, he can keep his counters, and you still get to put three new counters on the Ozolith. Now for the big question. Should the Ozolith be changed to do what the words actually say? Or should we leave it working the way it currently does? For this one, I think it's fine that the Ozolith doesn't do exactly what it says on the card. It's really intuitive the way it's currently worded, and I'm not sure if it would even be a net positive to make the text a lot wordier, just so that these super niche interactions are more clear. Also, if we did change the rules to make it work exactly how it's worded, then basically all we'd accomplish is making every Skullbriar player a little bit sad. Before we get to the next card, it's trivia time. Since we're on the topic of reading, today's trivia question is about card text. Which card in Magic is the only card that doesn't have any of the letters A, E, I, O, or U in its text box? I'll give you one big hint here. The answer is half of a split card. Stick around to the end to find out. Now back to the video. I kind of cheated a little bit for the next card because there are actually a ton of cards that have the same rules problem. But for our example, we'll use Rona, Disciple of Gex. Rona lets you exile a historic card from a graveyard when she ETBs, and she also has a tap ability that can exile cards. But the cool part is she lets you cast non-land cards exiled by her. That casting ability, sadly, does not function the way it says it does. Let's say we played a Cauldra Complete and we equipped it to our Rona. Cauldra Complete gives the equipped creature approximately 7,000 abilities, but the one we care about is the last one, that says whenever this creature deals combat damage to a creature, exile that creature. So if we attack with our Rona, and our opponent blocks, then Rona would exile the blocker, assuming it was big enough to survive the damage. Now, it's important to note here that the Cauldra didn't exile the blocker. Cauldra gives the equipped creature the exiling ability, so Rona herself would exile the blocker. Rona says you may cast non-land cards exiled with Rona, so if we're going by the card text, then we should be able to cast the blocker that Rona exiled. But, 
You can't. The game just doesn't let you do it. The exact reason for why you're not allowed to do this is a little complicated, so I don't think I'm going to explain it in full detail here. Who are we kidding? I love talking about obscure rules. To the comprehensive rules of magic, we go! Butterfly in the sky I can go twice as high Take a look, it's in a book A reading rainbow The rule we want today is in the section Linked Abilities. Rule 607.1 says an object may have two abilities printed on it such that one of them causes actions to be taken or objects or players to be affected, and the other one directly refers to those actions, objects, or players. If so, these two abilities are linked. The second refers only to actions that were taken or objects or players that were affected by the first and not by any other ability. And more specifically, Rule 607.2a says if an object has an activated or triggered ability printed on it that instructs the player to exile one or more cards, and an ability printed on it that refers either to the exiled cards or to cards exiled with this object, these abilities are linked. The second ability refers only to cards in the exile zone that were put there as a result of an instruction to exile them in the first ability. <sighs> so what does this all mean? Basically, if a card has two abilities that seem, well, linked? then they actually are linked. They only work with each other and not with any other abilities that you might be able to give a card. Now some linked abilities actually do make perfect sense, like Fiend Hunter for example. Fiend Hunter's first ability exiles a creature, and his second ability brings back the exiled creature. There's really no ambiguity there, and it's perfectly clear that if your Fiend Hunter puts on a Cauldron Complete and exiles another creature, then that one won't come back. But linked abilities like the one on Rona just don't really make sense to me. Rona says you may play cards exiled with Rona, so unless you know about linked abilities, it would be perfectly logical to assume that you could play blockers that your Rona exiled in combat with a Cauldron Complete. So should this rule be changed? I'm gonna say yes with an asterisk. I don't think we should get rid of linked abilities altogether, because like I said, there are a lot of linked abilities like Fiend Hunter that make perfect sense and work exactly how they should. But for cards like Rona, Beaumont Courier, and Mer Welder, I genuinely think the rules should be changed so that their abilities work with any cards that got exiled by them, regardless of what ability they used to exile them. That being said, it's entirely possible that this change would break the game. I don't think it would, but it's definitely possible. Like maybe you could play a Rona and then cast a Leveler and then play Metamorphic Alteration to change your Leveler into a Rona and then cast Omniscience somehow and then play every card in your deck and storm off and win. This combo isn't actually good, but it's a good example of the crazy possibilities that this rules change would open up. It seems like WotC invented the Linked Abilities rule to stop shenanigans like these so they don't accidentally print a card that makes some ridiculously overpowered combo. And maybe that's a good thing. But, since I like the chaos, I would be all for changing the rule. Our last card today is one that almost nobody plays in Commander, despite the fact that it's actually kinda good and can go in literally any deck. Fractured Power Stone is a 2 mana mana rock that also lets you tap it to roll the planar die. For those of you who don't know what a planar die is, it doesn't matter. You use it when you play Plane Chase, and nobody has ever actually played a game of Plane Chase. A planar die has four blank sides and two sides with weird symbols on them. The symbols don't mean anything in a normal game of magic, so rolling a planar die effectively does nothing. Now you might be wondering what's wrong with the text on this card. How could a card so simple not work the way it says it does? I mean if you tap the power stone, then you just get to roll a die and that's the end of it, right? That's the neat thing. You don't. That's right, for some ridiculous reason, if you use Fractured Power Stone's second ability in a normal game of magic, you don't get to roll the planar die. <sighs> Calm down, Tofu. Calm down. I wouldn't fault you for wondering, Tofu, why do you want to roll a die so badly if it doesn't do anything? That's a good question. It's true that Fractured Power Stone's second ability doesn't actually do anything. Or at least it didn't, until Adventures in the Forgotten Realms brought dice rolling into Black Border. There are now two commanders that have an ability that triggers whenever you roll a die. But if you're playing one of these commanders and you use your Power Stone's ability that says roll a die on it, the game just refuses to let you roll that die for absolutely no reason. 
As you may have guessed, I think this rule 100% needs to change, especially since we're getting more dice rolling commanders in Infinity. It's so counterintuitive that a card says, roll a die, and it doesn't let you roll a die. Now you might be thinking there's some complicated rules reason that they chose to have it work this way. Maybe rolling a die with no numbers on it would make for some weird rules contradiction with something like Nethery's Puzzle Ward, which references the value that you roll, since a planar die doesn't actually have numbers on it. But I am 100% sure that this is not the case, and I can prove it with one simple fact. Fractured Power Stone already triggers your dice rolling cards if you're playing Plane Chase. In the release notes for AFR, Wizards explicitly stated, while playing Plane Chase, rolling the planar die will cause any ability that triggers whenever a player rolls one or more dice to trigger. However, any effect that refers to a numerical result will ignore the rolling of the planar die. So they already made it work. Fractured Power Stone doesn't work with Netherese Puzzle Ward, but it does work with the two dice rolling commanders, Barbarian Class, Feywild Trickster, and Brazen Dwarf, if you're playing Plane Chase. So why is there a pointless rule that stops you from rolling the planar die in a normal game just to roll it? I don't even have a dice rolling deck, so I have no idea why this one makes me so annoyed. But if Mark Rosewater himself came to me and said, Hey Tofu, I'll let you make any one change you want to Commander then I would change this rule to let Fractured Power Stone work in normal games. In fact, I'm putting hashtag free Fractured Power Stone in the description of every video I make until this gets fixed. And I encourage you guys to join the action. If you watch any other Magic YouTubers, then tell them in the comments that they need to join the free Fractured Power Stone movement. Obviously, I mean this in a funny, nice way and not in a harassment kind of way. Be nice on the internet, everybody. Well... That video got a lot more intense at the end than I expected, but that's pretty much it for me. What do you guys think? Should the rules surrounding any of these cards be changed, or should we just leave everything the way it is? Did you already know all of these obscure rules, or did you learn something new today? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And now for the answer to our trivia question. Which card in Magic doesn't have A, E, I, O, or U in its text box? And the answer is... Reason. It just says Scry 3, that's it. And it also doesn't have any flavor text. If you got that one right, then go ahead and scry yourself three tofu points. Make sure to like and subscribe while you're at it. And as always, thanks for watching. Tofu out.